Hello, I am Dr. Mamie, host of Reality Talks. But let's talk about today's topic. And that is, is voting a right or a privilege? Our guests are Shirley Slaughter, Cheryl Smith, and James Stevens. I'm going to ask each one of you to tell me a little bit about yourself. I'm just an um, average citizen living in Detroit in Oak Park, Michigan. Um, I started to write later in my life after I um, retired from my day job. I was working at a Catholic church and I got inspired to write after I saw that there weren't too many of us Cap Black Catholics around. And I didn't know how that happened because when I was growing up, there was a lot of us. And so uh, I ended up writing my story and um, um, then I went on to write a couple of more books and I met Mamie Smith at a, we both belong to the Detroit Writers Guild and that's how we met and we've stayed in touch ever since then. Um, Mamie went on to do her fabulous show which she's doing right now <laughs> and I'm just into doing whatever I need to do. Just um, married to my husband. We've been married for, for a few years. We're both into second marriages and we both have children. And um, we, we're all caught up now in this COVID virus. <laughs> Thank you, Shirley. And we have a Cheryl too. And Cheryl, you wanna jump right in now? Tell us who you are. Sure, um, I am, um, I retired from GM after 32 years. I was a creative design studio engineer and um, worked with a lot of different people from all over the world and really enjoyed uh, my time there and working with everyone and the challenges that that, that brought as well. Um, I retired a few years ago when my husband got an opportunity out of state. So we've moved around a little bit in the last three years and have settled back here in Michigan right now. So Hi, I'm uh, Jim Stevens. I'm a retired school teacher from Detroit. I did teach in uh, Utica. My passion is teaching and uplifting kids. I'm a reading recovery teacher. And my last year of teaching, I took a lot of notes and I came up with a book that's called uh, Give Out Love and Love Comes Back. Let me begin by saying the Constitution gives every American citizen a right to vote. There are about four amendments to the Constitution that talk about voting, but there is only one that deals with race and color, and that is the 15th Amendment. And I'm going to read it. I quote, race no bar to vote, ratified February 3rd, 1870. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And I kind of looked up the word abridged. I had an idea, but I wanted to be sure. And that means reduced or shortened. So um, what it is saying to me is that you cannot be denied to vote based on your color and creed. But I had to figure out what condition of servitude meant. I knew what the words meant, but how, how was it applicable? And that was be, during the time 1870, because you know slavery was abolished in 1865, and uh, well actually 1862, and it went into action 1863, the Civil War ended in 1865. Prior to that, Black people were enslaved. So the, the writers of the Constitution decided that it was very important to put condition of servitude because it was saying that if you have been enslaved any time in your life, past, 
present or future, you could not be denied the uh, experience of voting. So now we're going to get into the questions and we're going to ask Shirley to lead us off. Here's the first question, Shirley. If no citizen should be denied the right to vote based on race and color, why are the Republicans and the Trump administration trying so desperately to keep red, yellow, black, and brown people from voting? Take well, off, Shirley. The, re the main reason is because they don't feel that they can win on their own merits because they know, they know they have these outdated radical beliefs and most of the majority of the population don't agree with them. And of course, the majority of the population consists of the, the, the uh, blacks, the reds, the yellows, and the brown people. So they um, know that the, this administration, and if you go back in the past with Jim Crow and all of that, the black race, that they knew that the only way to keep them disenfranchised was to keep that vote away from them. So they did everything they could to make that happen, and, but they did it secretly then. Everything's out in the open now and Trump is putting it out there because he thinks he can get away with it. But the problem with, it, with that is that the good white folks are becoming outraged because it's in their face too. And some of them are being affected by some of these rules and regulations. They're privileged. They feel that they can do it. They, they don't have any problems putting it in your face because they had it in your face before everything else, the social media and everything else came out and they got away with it. But, but it's just so open now that it's just so egregious to so many people that they're going to be in for a rude awakening. And I hope it's November 3rd. <laughs> I hope it's really rude. <laughs> Cheryl, you want to jump right in there? I, I think it it's all that um, Shirley has mentioned, but I also think that for Trump, it's even more personal. He um, has, he's addicted to the power that he has right now and the attention he gets in the global media. And as well as this, being president has enabled him to personally enrich himself and his family. He doesn't want to give that up. So he wants to protect that, as do the Republicans. If you look at um, the Republicans and our members in Congress, they tend to be extremely wealthy after just a few short years. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think they're desperate to maintain the status quo because it significantly personally enriched them. Trump also is facing a number of legal charges that have been paused um, as he is president and too busy running the country right now. So <laughs> once he is no longer uh, president and busy with running our country, then those charges can advance through the courts. And I'm sure he would rather avoid that if at all possible. <laughs> Some of those charges will um, no longer apply because the statute of limitations will run out if he is reelected and, and spends another four years as our president. So I think there's a number of different reasons for Trump and uh, the Republicans to be desperately trying to um, get themselves reelected by whatever means that they can. Very good. I agree with both of you. Uh Trump knows uh, those people are not supporting him, so he doesn't uh, want them to vote, uh, you know, Democratic. And uh, he, he's uh, working at it real nice and hard uh, every way he can, and he does have supporters who, uh, who uh, you know, send out false uh, texts and so on and so forth. But... All right, I agree with all of that. And I, I don't see it necessary, necessary for me to add anything to that. So I'm going to move on to the next question. And that is, what are some of the ways states and the administration are trying to deprive people of color from voting? And I'm going to start with Jim. Well, there's a lot of things that are going on. Uh... They, uh, they purge voter lists. Uh, if, if you haven't voted in in the last two elections, uh, 
you know, they just said, uh, take your n name off the list so you can't vote. Uh, and of course that affects people in low economic uh, districts. Um, the, they make uh, voter ID uh, restrictions. When you go to uh, register, many times you have to have a birth certificate. And of course, a lot of people don't have that. In New Hampshire, uh, you have to register uh, 30 days uh, before the election. And uh, people in the know about this uh, suppression say it, that shouldn't be. Uh, colleges like uh, a and M, a school predominantly African American. Uh, uh, they use gerrymandering. I'm going to bring Shirley in right now, Jim, because we're missing most of what you're saying. Uh, Shirley, you want to come in? Yeah, uh, one of the <laughs> one of the most blatant ways they did it was to try to kill the post office. <laughs> they hired this idiot to come in, and when he started, boy, did everybody get into action. Went down there on Capitol Hill and said, "Decease and desist." <laughs> um, you had um, uh, the, in various states, like in Georgia, where Stacey Abrams is. Uh, he he purged some of the about fifty thousand voters from the rolls. But see, they did that back in the days when they didn't have all this publicity. They would do they did this stuff all the time. And it was only when Barack Obama be, was running for office that they got these people actually didn't feel they didn't feel the intimidation that they once felt because people were encouraging them to vote because they were not voting because they had been so intimidated for so many years, which is a shame. But they were able to vote, and so the Republicans saw that as a, a as a call to arms to stop all of this. So they tried to kill the Voting Rights Act, which they did. They got the Supreme Court to tear that down. So that's when you get started getting all kinds of crazy stuff happening in different states. What the other thing that they're doing is uh, trying to keep, uh, make people vote in one and uh, take away the drop boxes. <laughs> and in my state, well, we're all here in Michigan, aren't we? Well, yeah. Michigan, Michigan, yeah. we got a governor that did it right and they tried to kidnap her. So. <laughs> Tried to kidnap and kill. They're they're desperately, and they think that they can change the rules. And what they need to understand is that they can't. Cheryl. Um, yep, I agree with everything that they're that both Jim and Shirley have uh, stated already. Some of the other ways was um, by requiring witness signatures and exact matches on your signature. Yes. <laughs> And then also um, stringent ID requirements. If someone, not everyone has access to a birth certificate for a number of different reasons, you know, whether there was a fire or a flood that destroyed the municipality building, um, storing old records, or if, if you were not allowed to be born in a whites only hospital a number of years ago, you know, you may not have a, a birth certificate at that time, or if you were born at home or, um, if you were born way back up in the mountains, you know, in a remote area of the mountains, you may not have a, a birth certificate. So there's, those are some of the ways that they're doing that. In addition to moving or closing the polling stations or reducing them, convicts, not allowing someone that has been convicted and served their time and paid their restitution um, and done their community service, you know, fulfilled all, made whole the state and their victims not allowing them to um, have uh, their right to vote again. And I'd like to um, add to what Cheryl said about the uh, prisoners. And uh, I think it was Texas, don't quote me on that, but um, when they, the same thing that, that Cheryl is mentioning, they said, you can't vote because until you pay all of your fees, because of all of your indebtedness, um, because you know, I can remember when uh, um, in my store, when I had to put uh, um, a aid in the prosecution of a woman who was uh, giving bad checks in my store here in Troy. <laughs> and, um, and so when I was called in, um, a testimony against her. Um, uh, of course, they'd recessed it for a while, but 
part of and then she confessed because they, I I really knew who she was and so they used that a lot that my identification of her and so she confessed and they sent her to prison and she had to pay restitution dipped us out of 900 and something dollars but uh, she only paid probably about three or four hundred of it back. I said, you know, I'm just tired of dealing with it. So I know that that does take place with prisoners. And, and so what, so they, it was just gobs of money. And these people said, well, we don't have the money to pay our restitution. And Bloomberg, did mm -hmm. you hear that? Bloomberg paid millions of dollars. Well, I don't know if it was one point some million, but it but to uh it was like thirty thousand of those prisoners, he paid yeah. their restitution dues so that they could vote. That so, was and, in the key state yeah. of Florida where that's mm -hmm. one of the hotly contested um states right now. So that was in Florida. And then of course I think I just like to add a couple of things of you know they purge the vote, the, the rolls mm -hmm. that, uh, and they did that in 2018, and of course in 2016 too, but we were not as aware as we were in 2018. They would just simply take black and brown people off the rolls. And, 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 and uh, another thing, they, they threw them away. What, and they got I, away with it. They got away with it. And one last thing, and Shirley, you can come right back in, but one last thing I want to say is that this one really got me when I read this. I'm not sure which state it was in. I think it was North Carolina. They said you have to have your ballots notarized before you even get the ballot. You have to do it. Go to a notary. <clears throat> then what they did was they limited the number of notaries <laughs> and the amount of and, and, and the number of notarizations they could do. I mean, it's just incredible what they're doing. Um, so, um, so Shirley, drop right in. You had something else you wanted to say. <clears throat> uh, well, they should be ashamed of themselves for okay. even thinking that they could do this and with their head held up, no sheets over their heads, <laughs> just, <laughs> just out in broad daylight saying, I'm going to take your vote away from you. The nerve of these people. I they, know. People are going to vote them out just for that reason. Well, and you have all of these white moms who saw um, George Floyd getting killed. This one woman, white woman, did a videotape, and she was ranting and raving in that videotape about what that officer did to that, 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 uh, that black guy, George Floyd. And she said she had been so indifferent to the racism before, but she woke up when she saw that. And then another one said that when he started shouting out, mom, calling his mama, that sprang her into action. So you have all these white folks going out now and protesting. And I, I told my husband, I said, the white people are the ones that are going to change this because they were the ones that tolerated this all of this time because they benefited from it. But yeah. now they see the light of what is that, that if we, if we all, go, if some of us go down, we all go down. We cannot thrive in a country like this and deprive certain individuals of their right to that same privilege. It's not going to work. It's going to explode. And that's, that's what I think is happening right now, especially with this pandemic. Some of the other things that they're doing with the Native American Indians is they're, when they do apply to, uh, like if they had a change of address or something, and they, they submit their change of address, they just don't forward it to the state for um, their driver's license to be updated or the voter registration rolls to be updated um, or they slow roll it through the process. Um, another thing is that in a lot of the, um, the Native Americans, they don't necessarily believe in personal land ownership and so on the reservation, everything is shared. So they don't have a specific address for their home and so in the, um, I forget which state it is, but they're requiring them to- South Dakota? Is it North Dakota? South Dakota has a different lawsuit with the Native Americans going on right now. They're the ones that are slow rolling everything through. Um, I'm trying to remember which state it was, but they, they are not allowing the Native Americans that um, use a P.O. box address for their mail rather than owning you know, their own <laughs> land in the reservation. 
And so they're not allowing them to register to vote because they have a PO box and not a specific street address, which they just don't have in the reservation. So there's a number of ways where they're trying to restrict, just restrict voting in general, you know, um, again, just so that they can stay in power and do all the things that they've uh, enjoyed doing for these last several decades without, like Shirley's mentioning, the awareness of the, the general population. I think one other way that um, they're impacting and limiting our voting is by over the last three and a half years, the Republicans have crammed through massive numbers of very conservative Republican judges to the courts, the appellate courts. And so now when we have things like the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, um, closing down all of the polling stations and then a lawsuit gets filed challenging that, it went to the first court and the judge, the federal judge said, you know, um, stopped the governor from implementing that order statewide and in, insisted on the polling stations remaining in place as they had. So they immediately, the Republicans immediately appealed it to the federal court of appeals, which had three new Trump appointed Republican judges. And guess what? They supported the governor shutting down all of the polling stations except for one in each county. Yes. So yeah. that's another way that that's they so, are. It's so undemocratic. So it it is. And it's a long term game plan that Mitch McConnell has been working on for a decade. Yes. yes. And, and so now it's implemented. And that's, that's kind of the scary thing. You know, it's like how long because these judges are in there for lifetime appointments. Sure. So it's it's going to be a long can time. Can I just say one thing? The, the judge that they got now, call, call me Barrett. Mm -hmm. If she gets in there, she's got the, the Affordable Care Act. She can also invalidate the election. Yep. That's what well, she's in there for. How if she can gets she do in, that? She can, she, can, she can stop the elections and make Trump the winner. How can she do that, though? Well, they're gonna. They they think they can do whatever they want to do, but I, 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 this is what he wants her to do is to. I don't. I was I was going along with that until um, I spent the afternoon studying and researching for our our meeting today, and the Constitution is pretty clear about the presidential election. She can interfere with a lot of the other elections, but with the presidential election, um, they have the dates spaced out enough so that the electoral vote it, um, has enough time and the states have enough time for the popular vote to get any issues resolved before it gets to the electoral vote being opened and counted. And if there's any kind of um, discrepancy or objection, it's the Congress has to resolve it. The electorate, they go back yes. to the yeah. Senate and the House uh, separately. Um, each have to agree or disagree to support the objection in the election. If both of them don't agree, uh, if both of them agree, then the votes from that state are tossed out. If one of them does not agree to object, then the votes are counted. So it's it specifically excludes it from going into the judiciary branch of government. Okay. So I don't think okay. let, me, let me intercede uh, just a little bit. If you recall the Bush, and I agree with everything Cheryl said, because I did the same kind of research. Um, but there is one thing that I think can tilt it in Trump's direction. And that would be if the vote is very close. And, and Trump is, a his thing is he sued people all of his life. That's how he operates. So he definitely would push it to the Supreme Court if he per <laughs> if he could. And, and, and I think unless we get the Senate, we take the Senate back. And I think that's what Shirley was addressing too. If we take the Senate back, then I agree wholeheartedly with you, Shirley. It wouldn't, it, but, the thing, but it would be suspect if the voting is close and then it gets, uh, we don't get the Senate back and then it goes to the Supreme Court um, Amy Coney to the Supreme Court. It wouldn't go to the Supreme Court. The the Constitution prevents that from happening. Well, it did. Let me let me stop you just a minute, Cheryl. It did with Bush Gore. That was a, that the Supreme Court no. made a decision on that. Yes, ma'am. They did. Excuse the, me. 
the from what I was reading in there, um, the process of the House and of Representatives and yes, yes. the Senate, they could not agree. So therefore, that's why the the they stopped the votes and it went to um, Bush instead of Al Gore. They followed that process. Yes, so, but it, 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 the Supreme Court did make a decision on that. Hello, everybody. How are you? Hi, everyone. Hi. This is, I'm so sorry I'm late. Uh, I got caught up in traffic in San Francisco, and I just uh, just kind of went on a tailspin. So I'm, I'm here. Uh, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of the conversation, but I'm glad I made it made it safe. Okay. And we're glad to have you. Um, now, did anybody, Cheryl, you wanted to say something else, I thought? Uh, no, I just jumped in, actually. Okay, Cheryl, how about you? Nope, I think I'm good. Uh, Jim, you want to say something? Oh, no, not, not yet. Not on that. <laughs> uh, Odell, here's where we are. Okay, before we move on, Odell, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll go right on. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is uh, Odell Johnson. Uh, I am a psychologist, uh, professor. Uh, I also head up an institution that I founded called the uh, Institute for Education and Justice, because uh, I just believe that education enrichment just covers a lot of the, the, the gaps that we don't, um, that we sometimes fall through, uh, just to being empowered with knowledge. And regardless of what condition and what uh, challenges you have, and if you're educated about how to recover from that or come out of that or improve or, or accelerate that, you know, I think education is really a platform that is very important for us to, to uh, bring into our daily lives. <clears throat> Uh, but among, among those other things, I'm also a, a criminal justice reform advocate. Uh, my, my, um, my major focus is on social justice and criminal justice reform. Uh, I provide research uh, around those areas and uh, also write, you know, write about those issues uh, and educate the public and my constituencies around those issues as well. And so uh, voting is, I think, the topic today. <laughs> yes, and, yes, and here's where we are. We're not going to backtrack. We're going to keep moving <clears throat> forward. So here's the question we're on, and that question is, what are some of the ways that the Trump administration and the Republicans are doing to suppress voting? What are some of the things they're doing? And I think that's what we were, we were talking about. You want to interject? We've covered Cheryl and Shirley have covered so many. <laughs> and Jim, no, you, you know, probably already covered what I've been observing as well. You know, on the, on the news and well, let, let's hear you <laughs> talking about. I mean, the, the the lines. I mean, we have so many. We have nine million people that have voted so far. Maybe today, that may, may have moved to twelve million people that have voted so far, and the lines are backed up all over the all over the country. Uh, the the polling, I mean, the, the issues that's going on out in California where the Trump administration has uh, demanded that uh, the Trump administration, well, that California remove ballot boxes that are heavily placed in communities of... of I heard that. Yeah, and so they are now uh, taking boxes out of communities of color like Oakland. It was in Oakland and San Francisco. Uh, in Silicon Valley, it's not... It's, 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 uh, uh, problem because that's where a lot of the Trump Trump Trumpians live. <laughs> so, but the areas that are that are not Trumpian, you know, kind of kind of populated, are the areas that are not being affected. I mean, they actually have a lot of accessibility to vote. But communities of color, you know, it's, you know, Latinx, um, uh, you know, San Francisco, a lot of larger gay population, all of those particular groups are not necessarily for Trump and, you know, like, that's like the strategy, the strategies that they know that. And so uh, that's a major issue out here right now. And people are just frustrated. They're standing out, you know, for, for eight, 10 hours a day, you know, in these, these very solo locations that are just limited to uh, not having the flexibility to go to another location. And people ha are having to have to come out of their neighborhoods to go across town. Now, if you have driven through the Bay Area, it takes a long time to get anywhere in the Bay Area. Um, so, so people are driving to, to the next community over, which could take an hour, hour and a half to get there. Then they're standing in line for 10 hours, uh, to wait for the voting. And, uh, last night they actually, the, the, some people didn't get a chance to vote. So they kind of just rolling over until the next day because 
they just don't have the resources of, of, of ballot boxes and also voting uh, precincts in order to for people to vote. So it's really it's really clogged up out here. Wow. What is your, what is your governor doing? He's fighting back. I mean, Gavin Newsom is the governor out here in D.C. He's fighting back. Uh, um, but you know, it's, it's it's really political. It's legal because you know we got lawsuits that are that are coming out of the Trump administration that's hindering a lot of things. They got uh, a lot of things on hold to whereby they can't move until some decision is made. We have judges that are involved that are mandating that 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 this, that the uh, the attempt to to limit the ballot boxes will stand, uh, particularly down in Southern California, closer closer to L.A. and the surrounding areas of Los Angeles. So. Um, the legal battle that they're having is what's hindering the progress. Mm. And, yeah, so the legal battle is holding things up in court. So it's kind of like it's kind of like they are kind of just betting on the fact that it will be held up so long until yeah. where I, yeah. uh, by the time the voting begins, a lot of people won't get a chance to vote. And that would also give Trump a reason if he does lose to say, hey, this was all a hoax, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, and he committed the hoax. Yeah, he creating the, the problem, but it gives him opportunity in case he does not win to say, "I told you so." You know, and then he can he can, he can fight the the final vote or whatever, and ask for a recount and all those types of things. And then, then that's, that opens up even time for even more corruption to enter into a recount. Here's the question that I want to ask: uh, In Detroit. I'm going to preface it with something. During the 2016 voting, the Detroiters did not do, African Americans did not do what they were supposed to do because they thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And so they just didn't all go out to vote. That was one of the reasons. Of course, the white suburbanite women voted for Trump. That was another reason. And then uh, I'm not sure if anybody can, there may be another reason that I'm missing, but I, those two stand out to me. Uh, and, uh, go ahead. I was talking to a young girl during that time and she said she, could, she didn't like Clinton. So I asked her why. And she said, it's just the, that she had heard all these negative things about her. So I reminded her that if you don't vote, Trump is gonna win. But yeah. apparently a whole bunch of those young yeah. people were feeling that way. And it wasn't just young people. There was a lot of people of all ages that were just so uh, felt neither choice was a good choice. And so they sat yeah. out the election thinking, what difference does my vote make? Exactly. Exactly. And so that present brings us into the next question. And that question is, does every vote count? Jim, lead us in. Well, definitely every vote counts. Uh, People will have to realize uh, that uh, that you know they're, that they're important, that they have an obligation, that they have to uh, you know they have to vo voice what they what they believe, and uh, throughout my lifetime, all the information that people normally get is, hey, you're replaceable, hey, you don't count, and, uh, and people learn to accept that. And now, with, especially with the media, being able to uh, talk with uh, someone like you, Mr. O'Dell, uh, <laughs> out there in California, boy, right. paint the picture fast of what is really happening. Right. And, uh, and the powers of be, like you demonstrated, uh, they throw it in a court, and this has been going on for decades. And by the time uh, something results in the court case, of course, the election is over, and people are getting more educated. And uh, and I, I assure them uh, to uh, be true to themselves and uh, just get out there and, and do it. And if you do it, your neighbors will know you're voting and uh, your relatives and it just snowballs. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the power will, will speak for itself at the polls. Shirley? Uh the your vote definitely counts, but you know what? There's this big old elephant in the room for the black community, 
And that big old element is in the guys, um, Jehovah's Witnesses, where they're taught, do not vote. <laughs> I have family members who are in that organization, in that cult or whatever you want to call it. And I think it's a conspiracy to, 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 to dilute the black vote, in my opinion, because I, I, that's a deal breaker for me to even get into that religion. Because if you can't <laughs> vote, if you can't vote, because in, in our democracy, we can rail against different religions. But if you don't vote and you let somebody like Trump in, you're not going to be able to do anything because he's going to the autocratic fascist society mm -hmm. where you won't be able to have the rights to say, I don't like America, I don't like the flag, or any of that. And the, the other elephant in the room is when they're sitting at those Trump rallies, you see the black folks behind cheering, <laughs> cheering for him. We always shoot ourselves in the foot. I'm talking to the black people on this panel. We, always, <laughs> we shoot ourselves in the foot every time. And to me, that's why we can't progress. <laughs> but surely, I mean, our, our part of our constitution is that we all have the right to vote for whoever we feel is the best candidate for us personally. So, you know, um, I can't, just because I have friends that voted for Trump, which astounds me, but at the same time, <laughs> I have to respect their right to vote, and I know they're good people. They just have their own personal reasons for voting for who they feel is the best candidate, and they differ from mine. So I still try to respect everyone. The fact that they're voting is what's most important. You know, they're not always gonna vote for the people I feel are the best candidate, but the fact that they are voting is good. And I think we need to just engage more of our population to get out and vote. And that's what I'm trying to encourage everyone. Of course, I'm trying to encourage them to vote for who I think is the best candidate. But, you know, the fact I'd like them to vote, period, for whoever they feel is the best. And I also have to comment on the Jehovah's Witness um, because all the people that I know that are Jehovah's Witness are white. I'm speaking from the black perspective of what my world is. <laughs> oh, Dale, you want to jump right in? <laughs> you know, it's important that we all vote cross-culturally, but I must say that, you know, in what we, I think what we've seen some fallout is in the area of black men, uh, and some of the Latinx men, but not as much, you know, in the Latinx community. But in California, we're seeing a lot of black men just protest and not voting. They just don't mm -hmm. have any faith anymore in the system. You know, with all the yeah. police brutality and officers walking away free from, you know, murder right before our very eyes, it's kind of like, that really is discouraging to black men. And it's a wounding that, the woundedness that, that really uh, the psychologically impacts their ability to show up in this space called political. Mm -hmm. The youth, I mean, you know, in understanding that Trump more than likely did have some uh, influences uh, from other countries and other players came in, in, in 2016 to, to win him that election, that, you know, black men are kind of feeling like it's going to happen this election as well. It's already happening. We already seen uh, uh, makeshift uh, Facebook ads and and, uh, and, and social media of people that, that are not, the, that have no idea that their picture is up saying that I, I'm a Trump, I'm a Trumpian, you know, a black man, you know. And so that is so discouraging. And, and it's just kind of like, it, it really it really just kind of disempower black men to believe that their vote really counts. <laughs> uh, because we still, once we get Biden in or Trump in, it's still going to be this racial attack against black men. Police are still going to be getting off for murder, <laughs> and it's going to be the protest, and it's just going to keep happening and happening. So it's such a lack of faith for black men to uh, be on be really strong advocates for voting. Now we certainly have a segment of black men that are doing that. Are doing that. We have celebrities that are black men that are saying go vote, but they're not reaching those trenches mm -hmm. of men that don't vote. They're reaching people that happen to watch sports. Not all black men watch sports. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. Well, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. <clears throat> and it's understandable 
but but uh, and it's not just black men. Black women are being uh, discriminated against in a lot of ways. Or, or, or Brianna was shot sleeping in her own bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brianna yeah. Tell. But, yeah. but 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 I agree with you. The the emphasis is on black men, and I think there's fear behind that. I really mm -hmm. do. I think there's fear of the black man because of what's going on, Odell. I think that black men need to rise above that because they're not going to help themselves if they don't take part in change. And mm -hmm. the way you change the system, one of the ways is by voting, whether or not it gets you exactly what you want, but you're not going to get anything if you don't vote. And so uh, I, I would push them in my own uh, if I, you know, way of doing whatever it is, if I were teaching, if I were writing and I do a lot of that uh, online, if someone says that to me, I'm going to give a comment about that and say something similarly to what I'm saying to you. And I know you're out there doing, I know what you do. You, you, yeah, yeah you, I know what you do. You're not one of those men, but yeah. I'm just voicing an opinion for the audience when they're listening that that, yeah. that, yeah, that should really, really, really push them to want to do something, whether or not we get the results that we think we should get. Anybody yeah. else want to talk? Shirley, I think you wanted to come in. Uh, yeah, um, uh, the, fear, the fear of the black man was stoked from way back in the slavery time. They, mm. they did such a horrendous job on the black male and his mm -hmm. psyche that, that the fear of them getting a clue and rising up was just probably making them not able to sleep at night. So they started <laughs> this narrative that they're, that they're scary just to just to keep putting a wedge there to keep them on their toes constantly without being able to give them time to think about what they could do to help themselves. And the other thing is when you vote, a lot of times you don't really know who these candidates are. You're not being educated very well on these candidates. And I mm -hmm. sat on the last election and got my little flyers and went up to the clerk's office and asked them, do they have any information on these candidates that register? They don't, mm -hmm. you know, and how are you going to vote for someone unless someone comes in and tells you who these people are and educate you, you're not going to know, but that's where it's going to start in your local districts. These black men that feel like they don't have a prayer, they're going to have to start getting, getting a clue getting educated, start understanding who these folks are that, that, that are their prosecutors, their, their attorney generals, their, their judges, and find out how these people think. And they, they have to get involved. And most of the time you can't because you're busy trying to act out a living. You don't have time to, you know, you got, but somebody is going to have to do it in each of these communities to change the direction of where this country is going. And so I, I know I've started educating myself a lot more than what I was, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to put somebody in just because his name is Joe Blow. I want to know who Joe Blow is. Yeah, I was going to say I'm uh, doing like Shirley did. Um, a lot of years I would, I would gather all the flyers coming out, but of course they're only putting out the positive things about themselves. Yes. That they <laughs> want you to know and the the opposition is putting out or screwing you know skewing um information about them that they would like you to use to not vote for them but since i retired i was able to just google a lot of people do a lot of research on my own um and if you're active in social media that's another good way to see what people are doing or not doing to educate yourself before you go in and actually vote um, and make a more educated, informed choice. And I think that's on all of us. It is quite difficult to do that when you're working and raising a family. Trump keeps talking about the white women in, in suburbia and trying to raise up all this fear. Right. What's funny is that it's kind of flipping on him because the white women, if you look at the suburbs now, the suburb that my husband and I moved to, I was so thrilled because one of the things that really drew us to it was we had literally people from all over the world. And so it wasn't just, just white people that were living out in the suburbs anymore. And it's not, if you go to the schools now, you will see it's not just white people anymore. It's people from countries all over the world. And 
Odell, did you? you know, so I like to piggyback on the show. So you know, the problem that when I can speak as a black man in America, mm -hmm. that when we hear, when we know that Trump appointed 130 judges and all of them were white, mm -hmm. African Americans and other people of color are more impacted by the court system. Right. Absolutely. What good does it do? We have no power to vote that out. That right. is, that is an appointment. When we know that. The, the uh, Supreme Court justice that's now being grilled, white mm -hmm. woman, very, you know, I don't, you know, but our positions are kind of questionable, but, and we got, you know, so many people dying at the same time from the coronavirus, but mm -hmm. he pushed that off in the two weeks prior to the election, and the mm -hmm. people have any, any voice in that vote. They're not having any voice in it because if Trump is reelected, then he got what he wants. So, you know, it's kind of like black men, and I'm speaking for black men that I talk to every day. Mm -hmm. Place in this, you know, we have we can't find our find no space that's comfortable and empowered and that's also powerful enough for us to have any impact to to influence the change of that. I mean, we are frightened to death of 130 white judges. The idea, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep, I do. You know, I do. Yeah. So because we, we know if we get pulled by the cop and it turns into a bad day and we end up in front of one of those judges, sure. They, oh yeah. They're, they're a proponent that was selected by Trump, and that's hardcore. And yeah. and that gets back to the, be nice. yeah the um, majority of the population in our prisons being black men you yes, know right. and so we're eliminating that vote right there. Right. What we can do is vote out the Republicans that are in office right now that rammed all those. That was a strategy of Mitch McConnell. That was a long term strategy that he spent yes. decades planning and executing yes. with the Republican support in the Senate. And so what we need to do as a population is vote out those Republicans that allowed that to happen and, and, can, and supported it because that's not right and it's not fair and it's not representative of us as a country. Mm -hmm. It's most of them in the Republican party. And, you know, and if that's the case, then you and not, blacks are not, that are in the Democratic party aren't gonna be voting anybody out. That'll have mm -hmm. to be the white folks that are out there, you know, protesting now. That's mm -hmm. going to have to take a look at those folks that they put in. Mm -hmm. And that's where they're going to have to change it. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And let's not forget, though, we the people. And the reason that you are seeing some of the things happening now, like in Minnesota, uh, where they did something with the police department that has been a racist thing for years and years, and they have done nothing. But when you have the people, black, brown, yellow, and red, and white, going out there saying, we're not taking that anymore. I agree with you wholeheartedly, uh, everything everybody has said, but let's not forget the people power. I don't go out and march, but I write. And I, and I call it like it is in my writings. And so there are other people that do other things that I can't do. So um, we still have to keep fighting. And that's what, that's what you have to tell those black men, uh, Dr. Odell, that you are talking to. I understand where you're coming from. I'm one of you. I'm, but we cannot sit down and say, I'm discouraged and I'm not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. We have to keep fighting. If we hadn't fought, we would still be slaves. And there are some states in Colorado, California, in some parts of California, some counties, they're doing some things differently. The governors are changing policy in regards to felons can now vote right out of out of jail. Mm -hmm. It's also yep. pushing felons can vote in jail, right? And that's just like really a no no for the Republicans. They don't do not do not want that to happen. They don't want to have those people who have, who have been voided out of society for whatever time to have that power. Yes. Uh, but some counties have, got, have pushed it through, and we're going to see a lot of more, a lot of more of that on the ballot come November. Um, and that, and that's, and I think if we have the governors and the leadership of the, of, of, you know, in our political, you know, community that's pushing policy like that, I think that black men, men of color, women of color will start showing up more because now the opportunities are there to eliminate some of these people that are causing all the harm. Exactly. Yeah. Now, moving on to um, the next question, and this is gonna take us back 400 years. We talked about voter suppression today, 
And we had so many ways that the, that the voter suppression is, is being done. Let's look at voter suppression, a history of what has happened. And let me just start you in by saying, before the Emancipation Proclamation, Black people were not even considered by many people as human beings, so they definitely could not vote. But after Reconstruction, which was between 1863 uh, to 1877, and then of course you after 1877, um, we got Jim Crow. So let's go back now to slavery and talk about how we, the, the black vote has been suppressed all the way up to now. Can anybody want to start with that? Wow. That's a whole lot there. That's a whole lot there. <laughs> <laughs> you just think about what you think. I mentioned the it's, 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 it's not so much, you know, that it was, it certainly has been systemically suppressed. Um, historically, 1860, 1863, 1877, sure, that was the Reconstruction period. And, you no know, Blacks can vote then, of course, you know, yes. and just, yes. they can vote then. And then 1877, uh, until I think 1902, I think in 18, if I can recall, in the 1880s, black were, blacks were being elected to uh, uh, political posts in, in different areas. And so we had some people that actually, like I think it was Booker T. Washington, people like that, it was, it was in the scene as becoming a leader in politics. But I don't know if that was really, really flushed all the way out the way it was a system of operation that was operational or it was a selective kind of person that the white, uh, the white uh, supremacy order kind of put in place. Certain blacks that they handpicked to do certain works. And I'm not, I'm not saying that that's accurate. I'm just my assumption based on what I, what I, what I read about that. But the suppression has been, uh, has been, it's all the way up until um, we actually, until we had the, 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 the bill signed in 1865, I mean, it's 1965. A 63. Was it 63 or 65? Yeah. Well, I mean, well, I guess what I'm saying, so the vote has been suppressed up until 1860, I mean, 19... Oh, up until today. Yeah. <laughs> up to today, yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, let me take you back to um, uh, Reconstruction. Um, as you know, President Lincoln had planned to work with the Southern states who had succeeded from the Union and to bring them back in with certain stipulations, but he was assassinated. And so Andrew Johnson, who was Southern and who was a racist, uh, became president. And so what he did was, there were two things that I only remember one right now, that he said that Southern states could do, had to do to get back into the union. And that one of them was, you just can't enslave people anymore because we freed them. So what he said was, um, you can come back in. And he did not put any stipulations. During the reconstruction period, here's how they suppress. And like I say to people, it's nothing new that's going on today. We've done it in American history. They, and surely you know this when we talked about Juneteenth. Um, what they did was they beat people up. They lynched them during Reconstruction period. They destroyed black communities. Tulsa, Oklahoma was one of them because that was later on, but they did similarly to that. Uh, they would send armies of uh, white people into this, these cities because they did not want them to vote. That's mm -hmm. voter suppression, but it was very, very, very violent. And when the, now at that time, as you know, we were Republicans, so to speak. Black people looked to the Republicans because Lincoln was a Republican. Right. And so, so therefore, we were not Democratic at that time. It was the Democrats who were doing the crazy stuff. And so, <laughs> so what, when, when the re, finally doing uh, somewhere around uh, 1875, I'm not sure about the year, that the, the, the Republicans got back in control of the Congress and they sent armies out to stop this. Mm. But then 
near the end of Re before Reconstruction, the Democrats got back in. Well, they didn't get back in, so to speak. They were going to put that person in as president. And I don't remember his name right now. But the Republicans made a deal with them that if you will support our president and not your candidate, we will let the South do what the hell it wants to. And that's exactly what they did. That then this is how Jim Crow came into existence. And you know what happened with Jim Crow. They changed the laws. They couldn't enslave the people. They just wrote in technically. But what they did was write laws that was the same as enslavement. And we cannot, re we must remember that black people, when you just free them, and they have spent for generations, for 250 years, with the mentality that I own nothing, including myself. I don't even own myself. And now you're going to throw me out there and say, survive. <laughs> and that's what so many of the Black people could not survive. They didn't know how. All they were used to was doing chopping cotton and taking care of babies or whatever else they were supposed to be doing for, for their masters. So a lot of those Black people then, even though they were free, went back to uh, their masters and say, give me a job. Well, they gave them, they treated them like slaves. So, and of course, you know about the civil rights movement in 1965 when Johnson gave his past the civil rights bill. That's when we began to emerge a little bit. And Jim Crowism began to subside a little bit, but it still exists today. Now, anybody else want to talk about that, the history of voter suppression? Um, um, you know, I, I don't know much about the history. All I know is what I've been seeing today with specific individuals. For example, I love Prince Harry and I love Meghan Markle, but I specifically <laughs> love Prince Harry because I fell in love with him because he has this empathy. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that in men very often. So he got it straight from his mother. <clears throat> and I just fell totally in love with him. Then he married Ma Meghan Markle. But now the monarchy is trying to destroy the both of them. He, because he married a, black, a mixed race woman. And her, because how dare you be this way? How dare you be graceful and beautiful? <clears throat> but then I go back to the fact that it was white people that mixed that caused the mixed races to begin with because they were raping the black slaves yes and then they disowned them and and then so we own them so now we got to be punished for it <laughs> so so the suppression of the vote is just was just another way to keep us in this mindset that we will never have anything and we'll never get anything and if you only way you will get it is to vote your way into success exactly. So they, they put a lot of prize premium on that vote, vote. And for some reason, white people have this, this <clears throat> streak of, they don't want blacks to succeed. And if they do succeed, they're jealous of them. So they gotta kill, they gotta kill them, kill whatever they're doing so they can keep that mindset that we're the ones that are superior, not you. That's why they did the Oklahoma City bombings because that, that was, a black Wall Street. They had money yeah. up in there. Talk They're over. not supposed to have that. So they had to fix it so that they couldn't have it. In my black community here in, in, in Michigan, I wrote my book on growing up Catholic, but I talked about, I, there was a gentleman who was from there whom I gleaned a lot of information from him because he said that they were trying to make the black community be the unwanted community. Therefore, it, could have no progress going on in there. They had these, <clears throat> they had these project housings in there until, until the 1960s. Then they started to build uh, single family homes. Before that, you couldn't buy a house. You could have the money, but you could not buy a home because they didn't want you to. So, and then they split the Royal Oak Township into two communities, the ones that had the homes on the, on the east side of the, of, the, of the street, of Wyoming Street. And then on the west side, where I grew up, was the, the uh, projects. And they deliberately split up the vote so that we're not united, you know. So it was always this business of keeping us separated, keeping us 
from from loving each other so that we could go up against this force you know keep us disloyal that's why you see the trump voters in there black voters in there waving the flags because you always will have that you will always have that black person that don't get it, that thinks that if they stick with the white man, they're going to get it. They're going to make it. And they're not. It's just a way to dilute our strength. So suppression is just all a part of that. Yes, I agree. Now we're going to move to the final uh, question or statement. And that is, what is the message you wish to leave with all voters for the November 3rd election. We're gonna start with you, Jim. Thank you. Well, I believe that voting is a right and I'm obligated to vote because I have a sense of duty uh, to myself and others. You are the only you in this world. You make a difference, everyone does. Mm -hmm. So take ownership and vote. Great. Absolutely. Shirley? <laughs> Go out and vote like your life depends on it, because it does. <laughs> <laughs> in Michigan in 2016, Donald Trump won by a mere two votes per precinct. Yeah. Just yeah. two votes. So your vote does matter. Great. Odell? 1970, uh, I moved to Flint, Michigan with my mother. We migrated from the South. Uh, my mother had, got her education to become a school teacher at a late age. She was about 45. She went back, to, she didn't have, she was a domestic worker up until she was in her late 30s and she wanted more than that. And so the South was just not having it back in those days. And in the 60s and 70s, <clears throat> we didn't have voting rights at the time. And my mother worked very hard to, to go back to school to still raise five kids. And, and I'm, the, I'm the youngest of five. And she, she migrated to Flint, Michigan for this great opportunity in Michigan. And she got there and she fell on her face with a, armed with a college degree as an educator. And she found racism up there as well. Of course. Yeah. yeah. She found it in Flint, Michigan. Now, Flint, when, we got, when, I got, when we got to Flint, Michigan, it was robust. It was, it was really... Black people own their own homes, the yards were manicured, you know, the General Motors, Ford, all those car companies were just, you know, they were, they were, they were the attraction of why people were migrating there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Of course, when I go there now, it's like a ghost town. Yeah. Her house has been torn down and many other blighted houses have been torn down. She's no longer with us. But I'm saying that, you know, what happened to the vote then? I mean, so... These cities fell apart, you know, um, due to, I guess, NAFTA, you know, where, it was off, where companies started moving offshore to do business much cheaper, and uh, our politicians kind of sold us out. Uh, and, 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 and black people, you know, they say when, when, when you get a cold, black people get the flu. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and the town still has the flu. I mean, the flu is very important. Uh, we, we've got to, we just got to you know, use the, that suffrage that our ancestors went through, uh, those fights in, in Birmingham and Selma, the marches, you know, and all the people that, that were harmed, you know, in getting, making this voting bill pass, we've got to honor that process. We got to go back, you know, oftentimes we just stay right here in the now, but that was a lot of work done back then. You know, way back to 1864, a lot of people died for this vote. And we have just thrown it away as a black community in many cases. Our vote do count. I mean, there's 45 million of us on the census report, but it's probably much more than that because every black person don't even participate in the census. <laughs> so um, we just got to really start showing up in every, every area. We need to make, uh, make, ourselves uh, make ourselves accountable when that census uh, report comes around and, and let it be counted. Because that's how we get funding into our communities to, to, to take care of our streets and things of that nature and schools. So voting is very important. So I say that across the board, it's not just about this presidential election. It seems like this is the only thing we really pay attention to for real. But that local stuff is what really hurts mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's where people don't vote. Yep. Right. I agree. Um, I 
was voting. In fact, I voted about a couple of weeks ago and, and took it over to uh, the clerk's office and put, and put it in the Dropbox. Oh, I want to say that I'm, I'm working with a saxophonist in Michigan and um, here, and he is, uh, has done um, a, a great extravaganza, I call it, where he's gotten Motown people He's gotten uh, uh, ministers, uh, judges. Um, is running now on um, uh, YouTube uh, for two days. Uh, I, I participated. I am a chief operating officer of his nonprofit. So I just basically said my little say about that. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, th there, there's, there's music, but there's talk. And they're giving, there's some excellent people on there. So um, sometimes when you uh, have a chance, if you, if you, my friend on Facebook is always on there, just kind of listen, this, not maybe all of it, but some of it. But this is of the encouragement that we are doing. And we have to do that with each other. We cannot, we have to keep pushing forward. Because if, as I said uh, recent, uh, uh, before, if we had not, if Martin Luther King hadn't died for our freedom, we would still be sitting in the back of the bus. And I have sat in the back of the bus in Mississippi. Wow. So I know what that's like. Yeah. <laughs> I got on the bus and, and I had to sit in the back because I was black. Mm. So, um, so if we hadn't done, we, we hadn't fought, we would still be doing that. If this is what the message that we have to say to people. Some of you are reaping the benefits of the deaths of many people, the deaths of slaves, the death of Martin Luther King, the death of Robert Kennedy, the death of a lot of white people who, who fought with slaves and died. So what you have to do is we have to keep fighting. And, and if we only take one step, that's progress. And that's my last thing is Keep fighting, fight with voting, fight with talking, fight with working together, fight with everything we possibly can to get equality for everybody. Yes. That's, that's the land of the free and the home of the brave. You know, I think that sometimes you know, we get into, black people get into our emotions, we in the now, and we think it's just really us, but I'm telling you, if it wasn't for the Quakers that were on the, was yes. it, that were on the trail. Yes. Uh, that to help Harriet Tugman, that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the Quakers that supported all the you know, the re rebellious revolutions of black slaves to create a pathway for them to escape or and, and become free. So I'm just saying that we just need to get more and more Quakers, you know, <laughs> today's time um, and everything that we are challenged with. Let me quickly say. When you mentioned the Quakers, this made, <laughs> made me think of a funny story. Right. And when I was doing research for my last book, An American Story, My Family and Yours, I yeah. was finding how people fought for freedom uh -huh. and how they freed themselves. Well, there was this guy who wanted his freedom. He decided that he would ship himself bodily to a place <laughs> in this huge box. I forget his name. It is in my book. And I had the picture of him in this box. I thought that was hilarious, but I understood where he was doing why he was doing it. Never. He put himself in this box and he shipped himself and it was help from some of the Quakers. And that's yeah. what reminded me of that story. So that's yes, story. they were that's very instrumental story. in helping. So that is a true story. that's a true story, correct? Yes, that's a true story. Yeah. Yes, Sorry. that's a true story. I'm going to say I'd like to thank all of you for participation. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice meeting, everybody. Bye. Nice to talk with everyone. Oh, let's, do, let's do this again soon, okay? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye now. When I am down and all my soul so weary, when troubles come 
and my heart burden be Then I am still and wait here in the silence Until you come and sit a while with me So I can stand on mountains You raise me up To walk on stormy seas I am strong When I am on your shoulders You raise me up To walk the night can be